Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop, here at chess.com. And I've been teaching chess to beginners and intermediate players since 1984. Helping them to achieve a higher level of proficiency in chess. And I can help you as well if you fall in that range of skill. Once you reach the advanced end of the intermediate level, we'll hand you off to a stronger coach. Well, one of the means by which we improve in chess is by evaluating and analyzing our own games and reviewing them for mistakes that we made, for mistakes that our opponents made. And I showed how to do that in the first part, emphasizing the importance of reviewing your games on your own, without any other assistance, without any chess engine, without any app or software, without any coach even. It's important to learn how to review the games on your own and it will develop your analytical thinking and help you to begin thinking analytically during the course of the game while it's in progress. And so that's what we're going to do today. Now we showed already how to go over the games on your own. In part two, we showed you how to use the various tools and resources here at chess.com. Now in part three, I want to introduce you to another resource. And this resource is particularly beneficial to beginners and intermediate players especially beginners. It is an app, it's called Decode Chess, but it has many unique features that cannot be found anywhere else. Let me get logged in here. Um, the first thing I want to bring to your attention is when you log in, you get this screen that's completely blank except for the chessboard. And you can use it to import your game by loading a PGN that perhaps you already have on file. You click load PGN. Your file manager opens and you can pick the game of your choice, click on it, click import and there it is, and you can see it begins to assess the situation. Now, let me actually take my mug off of the screen because you don't really need to see me, but there will be information on the screen behind where I'm sitting that I want to be sure that you're able to see. Now, before we talk about the features of Decode Chess, I want to show you the other means by which you can import games. Another means when you click on import is you can paste a PGN here from your favorite chess database or if you have one over here at chess.com, say the game that we've been looking at, for example, um, click on the share dongle, click on PGN. And on chess.com, it actually saves the PGN in two different formats. There's the format with the man icon that includes the notes that we added on our own here. And then there's the format, which gives the computer evaluation, where it identified 
um, mistakes and best moves and so forth and blunders. Um, I want to point out though that not all formats are compatible with Decode Chess. If we highlight and capture this and paste it here, Control V, you'll note that it does not load. The text turns red. If you click on the import button, it'll say, please select a game. So there's something about the format when I add my own notes that um, Decode Chess does not recognize. So in order to import that game, I have to use the computer notes, which it does recognize. We'll simply paste over that. And now it recognizes the format, and when you click Import, it loads the game under a separate tab from the first game. <coughs> There's a third way to put in your games, and that's manually. Just click on the plus button, it'll open a new tab, and just start moving the moves. E4, E5, Knight to F3, Knight to C6, Bishop to B5, the Spanish game, Bishop to C5, the classical variation, Kingside Castle, Knight to F6, Bishop takes Knight, Queen's Pawn takes Bishop, Knight takes Pawn, Kingside Castle. Notice that in this panel, the moves are being filled in automatically when you make them on the board. After Kingside Castle, which we pointed out in the previous video that was a mistake. Pawn to d3, rook to e8, knight to f3, bishop to g4, pawn to h3, bishop retreats to e6, bishop to g5, Bishop to e7, Knight to c3, Pawn to h6, Bishop to h4. You may notice, by the way, that some of the, pe the some of the moves have color coatings to them, and we'll mention that in a moment. What a move this was. Knight takes pawn, a nice discovery against my bishop, which only has one defender, but he has one attacker, two attackers. So bishop takes the bishop. Knight takes the knight. Bishop takes the queen, knight takes the queen. Queen's rook takes the knight. Queen's rook takes the bishop. King's rook moves to e1. Bishop to d5. I did not want him to capture and double and isolate my pawns, so I played knight to d2, rook takes rook check, rook takes rook, rook to d6, pawn to f3, rook to g6, king to f2, rook back to e6, rook takes rook, Pawn takes rook, and that was a blunder, and you can see it lit up in red. 
It was a blunder because it traps his bishop. His bishop does not have a safe square to which it can move. And I should have played pawn to c4 to trigger that trap. We mentioned all this in the first video, so I'll not re-comment. You can check out the first video for detailed explanation. But there is no explanation for me having played a3 instead of c4. So that's red. He played king f7, which gives me a second chance. So that will turn red. I did not play <laughs> the second chance. I played king e3, still failing to execute the trap. So that will turn red. And he gave me a third chance. And for whatever reason, it finally dawned on me that his bishop was trapped. And I finally unleashed c4, which wins the bishop and wins the game, basically. When you're a piece ahead, you should, for most part, win the game. He played king to f5. I played pawn captures the bishop. He played bishop pawn captures the pawn. g4 check. King g5 making his way to h4 and h3. So I played king f2 so that I can defend. King h4. King g2 protecting. And I realized that I could cut off his king with f4, followed by knight to f3, and it would be checkmate. He must have also recognized that, so he played e5. And I said, well, now I can't play f4 because he'll take my pawn, and then the king can escape totally overlooking the fact that if my knight was on f3, it would still be checkmate because my knight also cuts off the king. I didn't need the pawn to cut off the king. I only needed to move the pawn out of the way so my knight could take its place. Chances are good had I played f4, he would have played e4, pawn takes, pawn takes, knight takes. <clears throat> But, having talked myself out of the correct move, I played knight to f1 with the plan of transferring my knight to f5. Although, that would not have been checkmate because his king could have escaped. However, to the wonderment of anyone watching, black played a helpmate, pawn to g5, trapping his own king, and then it doesn't matter if white plays knight g3 or knight e3, nothing can stop knight f4 checkmate. I chose g3, my opponent realized his blunder, and resigned with mate on the next turn. So those are the three ways to um, get a game loaded into decode chess. As you load that game, the move list fills up with color-coded moves and the chart over here on the right in the game info panel which can be clicked on to expand and contract. Well this is an eval chart where you can hover over it at any point and see the move by move evaluation. The white circle here shows the current move. If we back up 
you can see that white circle moves to correspond with the move number that you're on. But another feature here is you see these peaks. We all know where that happened because of the two consecutive missed opportunities, but three consecutive blunders. I finally got it on the third try. But in case you didn't take note of it during the import, you can say, hmm, I wonder how I went from plus three to plus 0.69 and just click at that point and the game will go to that point on the move list. And you can see, oh, I played A3 and that was a blunder. And you can try to figure out why it was a blunder. If you didn't already figure it out in your own analysis, or if you can't figure it out, that's when you use your resources. And once a game is completely loaded into Decode Chess, that's when you can click on Decode Game and it will begin to evaluate the game on a fairly superficial level. I would say it's roughly equivalent to when we evaluate on chess.com using the 18 ply evaluator. <clears throat> it doesn't dig very deeply. It does a quick um, superficial glance. And so let's click on that. And so far, we haven't seen anything really unique about decode chess. But we will momentarily. Note the progress bar starts counting. And even before it's finished, some information begins to fill in here in the decode panel. Now, while it's um, doing its thing, let me bring your attention to um, some of the mechanisms over here in the chessboard area. First of all, you can see that when arrows are drawn, you can make them darker or completely invisible or anything in between depending on your preferences. Secondly, as already pointed out, the moves are color-coded and the arrows are color-coded. To get a full description of the various codes just click on the question mark and you can see the various codes green moves are notable moves. The pea green are inaccuracies. The orange, kind of a burnt orange, are mistakes. And the red are blunders. And then you have various color-coded arrows as well. And there are some other things you can read about here. You'll note that the notation is figurine. Uh, presently, algebraic notation is not available. Figurine is the only notation available. Chess.com, you can switch back and forth from um, text notation to figurine notation. Now, if you're colorblind, there is no way to determine the difference in these colors. You have to rely on the information over in the decode panel. Okay, what else do we have here? We've got the navigation buttons where I can go all the way to the end, all the way to the beginning, or increment a half move at a time, forwards or backwards. If I was the black pieces, I can look at it from black's perspective by clicking here. This button allows me to set up a position. This button allows me to play the decode chess computer from the present con current position that is on the board. It will take up the op opposing pieces. This button will give me the Forsyth English notation of the current position. 
if I turn this button on, it will give me a line of computer analysis. We can turn that off, turn it on, and go back and forth between. Now once it's off, it won't update. You have to have it on to update. Okay, off. Oops. Uh, off. Okay, correct. Okay. <clears throat> So those are the buttons. One other thing to note, and before I come back to this, set up the board, is you can change the person's turn to move. You can click here and it'll make it black to move from that position. Now why would you do that? You really wouldn't necessarily do that in during a game um, unless you wanted to know what the opponent's threats are. You might say, okay, if black could take a second turn in a row, what would he play? Flip it over so that it's black to move and then let the computer evaluate and tell you what black would play. Why would you want to do that? Well, you'd want to do that if you're having difficulty um, determining what your opponent's threats are. The best way to determine your opponent's threat is to ask, well, what would he play if it was his turn to play again? Now, when would I use this set up the board? Well, I wouldn't use it from the middle of the game, most likely. Let's click on the plus sign here. This is just like the um, title bar in your window. It'll open a new tab. And you can click set up here, or you can click set up here. But if you ever close this and want to get back into it, you simply click here. This is especially helpful if you want to study specific positions and just set them up. Maybe you're getting a position out of the newspaper or out of a book and you want to put it on the board. You would use that here. Otherwise, if you're getting it off the internet, just copy the Forsyth English notation and paste it as shown before. But here's a fairly valuable teaching tool also if you're a coach like me, where you can set up various positions. Actually, let's put, let's put this here, let's put this here, put this here, give them a pawn, a bishop. To get the black pieces, click here. And then to select the side to move, you can click here. Or again, you can click here or here. Now this is another place where alternating sides could be beneficial because in this particular position, the side that wins is dependent on the side whose turn it is to move. And you can actually set up dual puzzles as we have here. In this position, if it's white's turn to move, white will win. If it's black's turn to move, black will win. You can also have the computer solve from either side. So for example, here it's white's turn to move, I click on the orange plus button and it will decode this position. And as you can see, it's the move progress indicator get, is here, but it begins to populate the decode screen with information. It gives the best line. It tells you why the best line is the best line. It shows you threats that the side not to move has and those threats are illustrated with the red arrows. The good move is illustrated with the green arrows and if there are any player plans they'll be written here and illustrated in this color blue arrow. Once it's completely done processing you have a lot of information and six tabs of information here. 
We're not going to go over this information in depth right now because we'll go over it later. But just for the time being, to show you that the information is there. Now, for those interested in this position, this is the best move because it removes the defender of the rook, puts the king in check, captures the black knight, and after the king gets out of check by capturing the rook, this rook is now undefended and can be captured, and white will win the game. Black cannot promote in time because well, you cannot draw arrows. So sorry. Oh, so sorry. I accidentally um, I accidentally um, there, go to app clicked on the screen. That brings me to a good point. <laughs> Notice now I've got a, what, what happens to my information? Well, it automatically gets saved up here. Um, we didn't actually name everything, but there's the game that we loaded manually. And and you can put give it a name, and there's the position that we had set up. I accidentally closed it. And in order to edit this, you could just click on it and type in game example. Or, or put in any information you want. <clears throat> um, I was, what I got sidetracked, I was just pointing out that you cannot draw arrows or highlight squares as you can over here with with chess.com. All right, now, where's that information? Well, it's right here. That information that we just had is right here. It's saved with the explanation. Now, I can actually take the same setup now and run it for black. Now, you'll notice that as it's evaluating this next setup, there's a green band there. This green band tells you that you have yet to look at that evaluation. And when we click on it, that evaluation comes up with similar information as before. In this example, with black to move, the rook captures the bishop with check, the king captures, and then the knight forks and wins the rook, and it's black who will win the game. All right. Once you've saved that information, it'll be forever in your history until you delete it. Let's go back to where I left off. The game has been decoded. We've shown you all this information. One other thing to note is you can get a better look at the move list by using the slider and moving it to the left, making this board smaller and this panel larger. And of course, it makes the decode panel larger as well for all the information that may or may not be there. Um, I have mentioned to Gideon Segev that it would be really nice if this move list could be moved over to this side and given the ability to expand and contract like these other th items so that we can get the maximum board size here for people with weak eyes. By the way, there are a few color options here. I also recommended that they make this user-definable so that I can select 
cracked my own RGP codes for the dark and light squares. A simple color palette would do that. And, uh, when I say simple, I don't know anything about programs, so I don't actually know whether it's a simple process or not. But I do know other apps have that, like Lucas Chess, for example. Anyway, but in preferences, there are some predefined, there are four predefined choices. And that is actually too harsh on my eyes. And that, I don't like the contrast. This one's slightly better. But right now, the plain one is you've got four sets of pieces from which to choose as well. <clears throat> Okay, so we've shown you various features on how to set up. We've shown you how to import your game, how to input your game, as well as import. Let's move on. Once the game has been decoded, you'll note that each and every move has an explanation. Now, again, this is really targeting beginners and lower intermediate players more than higher intermediate and advanced players this particular software and you'll note that because of the explanations state what might be fairly obvious to an advanced player for example here it tells me oh let's go back to, to the very first move actually that white played e4 in that it's a good move and it tells me one reason it's a good move is because it guards d5 another reason it's a good move and if by the way if you click on here you can actually click and show that if your opponent plays d5 you can take it or if he plays knights to c6 Knight f3, and then plays d5, you can take it. So it points out that it guards d5. You say, well, that's obvious. It's obvious to you, but it's not obvious to a raw beginner all the time. So this is extremely valuable to raw beginners. Really, you don't have to be a raw beginner. Uh, even an advanced beginner to a lower and intermediate player will find great use here. It enables you to move to e5 if your opponent doesn't occupy that square. It vacates e2, which enables knight to e2, but more importantly, it enables the bishop to get out of bed. Uh, so one thing that would be nice is if we could move these move the positions of these um, notes or hide them, collapse them completely. Uh, it would be nice so that we can hide the notes that we don't really care about. It would also be nice if I could add my own notes either here, as we can with chess.com, or even over here. I'd like to have some notes because it's interesting. It points out that it vacates E2 enables knight g to e2 but it does not oh yes it does right here makes a way for the bishop to go move along the a6 f1 diagonal <clears throat> for example bishop c4 now personally i think that's as a coach more important than this note so i might like to have that up higher so if you developers watching this video could give me a way to um, slide this up to here or to promote this. You know, at chess.com, I can right click and promote something to a, or move something up the list, higher on the list. Anyway, it gives you all the different things and some examples if you expand that. And again, I'd love to have a way to just turn this on or off if it's not really pertinent. Okay, and it does that for each and every single move 
that was played. It'll tell you if it was a good move and why it was a good move. Now, before we go any further, there's another feature that this has in the Game Info panel. When you click on this button in the Game Info panel, it says Show Stats. It covers up the graph and it tells you how many moves for white were notable, how many were inaccuracies, how many were mistakes, how many were blunders, what the average cent upon loss was, and it does the same for black. Now, I don't know the criterion that determines the difference between an inaccuracy and a blunder. It probably has to do with cent upon loss on that particular move. What is cent upon loss? Well, a pawn is worth 100 cent upons, and so 53 cent upons is a half of a pawn, or just over half of a pawn. What it's saying is when it compared your moves with the best moves that it came up with, there was a difference in, in evaluation. So, for example, if the computer's evaluation for the best move at a given point, let's go back here. If the computer's evaluation for the best move was negative 0.12, that's 12 centipons in black's favor, but the move you made resulted in a score of 0.37, the difference between those two moves is 49 centipons. Well, what they do is, so they compare move by move, the best move score with your move score, add up the differences, and then divide by the number of moves to get the average centipon loss. So basically, the higher the number here, the worse you played, and the lower the number, you, the better you played. <clears throat> so it gives you kind of a rough idea. If I'm losing half a pawn per move, that's not too great. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. All right, now, there's another very valuable tool here we're going to get into. And I'm going to combine it with this. But you've noticed this orange button. I've already used it when I did the setup. It's also equal to this Dig Deeper button. At any point, you can get a much more in-depth evaluation and explanation of a move and a position. Again, when we hit decode game and we go through, we get these very superficial descriptions over here. And they can be valuable. But there are some key positions that you might want to dig deeper. Now, how do we find those positions? Well, that's where we're going to use this up here. When you notice when you hover over these numbers, they become encircled and a finger appears. Here you just have a cursor, but when I put the cursor over the number, it turns into a finger, which means it's clickable. When you click that number, it moves the move list to the first inaccuracy that appeared in the game. Click it again, it'll go to the second. Click it again, it'll go to the third. Then to the fourth, and then to the fifth, if there is a fifth, but once it shows all, if you click it again, it'll go back to the first. And that's going to be the same for your mistakes, your blunders, and um, your opponent's inaccuracies, mistakes, and blunders. First black blunder, second black blunder, third black blunder, fourth black blunder, fifth black blunder, back to the first. <clears throat> Well, what you can do then, those are going to be your critical 
most critical moves where you want to have much deeper analysis. So I'll click on the first in accuracy. I'll click the orange button. Then I'll click again and click the orange button. Click the third time, click the orange button. Click the fourth time, click the orange button. I've got one mistake, orange button. I've got three blunders, one, orange. Well, my second blunder was the same as my first, so I'll skip over it to the third blunder, orange. And then I'll do it for black. First, inaccuracy. Second, first mistake. Second, first blunder. Second was the same as the first. Third blunder. And I believe, um, actually, this was the first blunder. I forgot it already cycled. Well, at any point, you can click on that and click your orange Dig Deeper button. Once you're done with that, you can hide that and note the orange vertical bars in your move list. These are critical moments that appeared in the game that you did a deeper decode. And you can go to that point and click on it, and it'll bring you to that point. You can also click Decode Status and expand this panel. And notice that all of those appear here. Now, at the moment, it's still processing some of those. But as they're completed, the green band will be on it, indicating it's ready. Or perhaps you already looked at it, and the green band will go away. In the move list, the current move is circled. But notice that the evaluations that you haven't looked at yet are also circled with the green band and other evaluations are underlined with the solid yellow. <clears throat> so we now have our game overview here, and then each of our critical points here. And you can click on those critical points and go directly to them, or you can go to the start of the game and just go move by move and get your information Oops, sorry. I need to click here to go to move by move. Otherwise, it teleports me in the in the panel that I've selected. So if I'm up here and I've already selected this panel, it'll move me along that way. So to move along this panel, I have to actually select that panel. Well, in any case, as you move along. Note here, this was shown as, let me make this a little darker. This was shown as an inaccurate move. It's actually a book move, so what it's saying is the book move is not preferred. But notice it says A6, Morphe's defense would be better, although it doesn't tell you it's Morphe's defense. That's, a, that's one thing that they don't have is they don't have any opening information. They don't have the name of the opening. They don't have the ECO code. Nothing like that. They don't have the move pedigree. They don't have the database access. Um, you'll have to get all that information over here at chess.com, and I showed you that in the previous video, so I'm not going to show it to you again other than to glimpse at it. And, and refresh your memory. Check it out in part two. Analyze your own games part two. We'll have how to use those features. So here's an example where it says A6 would be better. And it says the reason A6 is better is because it threatens to capture the bishop. 
a6, a takes b5. Now, I know that looks like you're making two moves in a row for black. Don't get confused by that. It's only pointing out that when he plays a6, if white doesn't do anything about it, remember when I said switch the board around and see what your opponent is planning? What would he play if he could take a second move in a row? Well, that's exactly what this is, is doing for you. It's saying if black could take another turn in a row, it would capture this bishop. Therefore, a6 is a good move. It also tells you that it intends to play knight to f6. Although I'm not clear on how a6 prepares. Let's see if it gives us any information on that. It says after a6 and knight to f6. Why wouldn't I be able to play that now? <clears throat> I'm not sure why that doesn't allow, why that um, wouldn't be possible with, with bishop to c5. It would be nice to have a little more explanation as to why that's pertinent. Um, but anyway, coming back to our move list, you can move along. And when you get to the first underlined move, you'll notice how much more depth there is. And you'll see certain things highlighted. If you forget what everything means, you can um, go to your legend. The one with the green band is a decoded position that has not been viewed yet, like this one. Uh, it would be nice developers if you're watching if we could actually because I went through and I clicked on that decode and it perceived it as me looking at it when I actually hadn't looked at it yet so it would be nice if that was something I could mark as having been viewed or having not been viewed in fact I'm gonna send an email to Gideon to that end Well, let's talk about the information that appears when you do look at a decoded position that has had the orange button clicked. You'll notice you get six tabs in the decode panel, each of which has different kinds of information. The first is a summary where... Um, we're told that the position is equal, but black should beware of white playing pawn to c3. And that's in orange. In the second portion, we have the explanation of the best line found by this particular version of Stockfish, which is the neural network version. And when you click on here, You'll notice the highlighted arrow is emboldened while the others are made more translucent. And you can play through that best line with different arrows appearing, drawing your attention to different things. And each move has additional information in the panel within the panel. Let's go back, point out that it tells us, okay, the explaining the best line of stockfish. Now you'll recall the opponent did not play the best line. If you click back here, you can see he actually castled. <clears throat> Oh, and it's telling me my move was was not the best move. That's actually the position I I probably should have decoded. I actually decoded the wrong position by accident. 
nonetheless, we still, just for the illustration purposes, there is a learning curve, as you can see. But you can see the explanation. It tells you why knight takes e4 is better. Knight takes e4 is beneficial because it threatens, well, if you click on it, it'll open up additional explanation. So knight takes e4 is better because it threatens to play knight takes pawn. Or perhaps queen to d5. A move that would be impossible if this pawn were still here. So it points that out. When black plays knight takes e4 and white plays c3, for example, black can castle. And now white's plan to play queen c2, which was the purpose of pawn to c3, um, is, is thwarted because after bishop takes pawn check and rook takes bishop, the knight captures the rook. Another explanation here says white cannot play rook e1. That's even worse for white because black can play knight f2, etc. Um, he can also play bishop takes f2, forking the king and the rook and winning the rook. That may be here under more. Let's see. Uh, white cannot play d3. And here, see, this is where it would be nice, Gideon and developers, if I could edit this myself, or again, move these up and down in, in uh, the order in which they appear. White cannot play d3 here because of knight f2. And it goes on and gives explanation on top of explanation, but there is, it's interesting that in response to rook e1, it says black can play knight f2, but it doesn't point out that black can play bishop f2, forking the king and the rook. So perhaps the reason is that maybe this is a better move. I'm not certain as to um, why the bishop takes f2 option is omitted. But it's got so many options here. Maybe it'll appear somewhere down here. And that is another element of this. Um, if you're not careful, you can get overwhelmed with information overload. So you do need to take some of this information with a grain of salt. There's so much here. And you'll learn which information, as the more you use it, the more you become accustomed to it, um, the more you'll realize which information you really want to focus in on and which information you can overlook. <clears throat> or at least maybe not overlook, but not spend as much time with. Uh, in the next panel in the summary are the major threats. C3 is a major threat. In fact, it's already been put on the board. You have to actually come back to this position to see that C3 is the major threat. If you close this and click on this one, notice that the highlighted arrow changes. You can also click on the arrow itself to focus on that particular one. Okay. So these are the threats that white has. Click on the expansion of things you should pay attention to. Pay attention to the white rook 
at F1 that supports this pawn. And again, you can click for additional information at each and every recommendation. Um, under Peace Roles, when you click on Peace Roles, you get these various arrows. And I'm going to actually make them slightly less solid because I want to illustrate that you can point to any one of these arrows and it'll darken that arrow and highlight that piece and expand in the information window the role of that particular knight. You can also click on the piece itself to see the role of that bishop. What's it doing? Well, it's using the a7g1 diagonal. Um, it says that the black bishop at c5, it says, is threatened by the black bishop. Um, that's, some of the verbiage here is a little confusing. Let's see, what he's saying is after knight takes, white cannot play. Oh, here we go. This is the move I was talking about earlier. Um, something's missing here. It should say F2 is threatened by the black bishop. So it looks like there's a... Um, Looks like there's a typo there. Can capture the white pawn, guards the square at d4, etc. So any important uh, role that you want to consider, figure out what's it doing there. You can click on that and it'll give you an explanation and you can get even more in depth. Threats. Well, we already saw the threats the major threats here. Why is there a separate tab here? I'm glad you asked. You'll see the same three threats here as you saw in the summary. But this time you also have this toggle switch. If we expand each threat and then click this toggle switch, it'll tell us how this threat is affected by the best move recommended. So the threat of C3, for example, and it's a threat because it guards D4. It's a threat because it vacates C2, enables Queen C2. Um, it's, it's a threat because it controls D4. So these two are a bit redundant. It's a threat because it intends to play pawn to d4. It supports the move pawn to d4. That is a valuable piece of information. See, this is another one where I'd like to move that up a little bit and completely hide this one because it's redundant. Um, C3 undermines de certain good moves because it intends to play d4, etc. Well, when we show how that threat is affected by playing the best suggested move, now, sometimes it won't be affected at all. But in this case, um, starting with knight to d4 solves the problem because after kingside castle and rook d1, now f2 can be captured, either by the knight or, as we saw previously, by the bishop. If we look at the um, next threat, and we can close this one to minimize the amount of information we have on the screen at any one time, the threat of knight to c3, oops, sorry, um, let's back this up. How do I get to that position? Oh, 
I see. That's right. I forgot what I was doing. The threat of knight to c3. By playing knight to c3, um, this pawn becomes defended. So by capturing that pawn first, knight to c3 becomes irrelevant because knight takes etc. And now there's no more danger. Okay. The threat of d3 before. The threat of d3 is to vacate d2 and enable knight to d2 and also allow the bishop to move along the c1 h6 diagonal which is in my opinion more important than knight d2 and um, that threat is dealt with because now Black can still black can still jump in and capture on f2. It says outcome. The best continuation here after knight uh, pawn to d3 is knight takes and then queen h5 and queen f6. It says uh, now knight h3 is a discovered check. And it's a double check. And um, a winning position for black. Okay, so there's your threats. And sometimes it will have no effect. Sometimes the, the best move doesn't deal with every single threat. But it's the best you can do. So keep that in mind. Good moves. It'll tell you the good moves that black has available. The best of which is knight takes e4. It says h6 is a good move, but you can see there's a difference in an entire pawn evaluation. So I don't really know how good h6 actually is. Plans. Right now it says we were not able to find an attacking plan for black, but sometimes this will be populated with information that will give you an idea of how to proceed from a position like this and why. Concepts. Now, I didn't point it out in the summary, but in the summary, there's a pay attention to tab that gives you a lot of things to pay attention to. Um, I guess maybe I did and then um, didn't really highlight it as much because these are already open, so I must have shown it to you and forgot. But you'll see here that some of the information here is duplicated under concepts, but you'll see that there's a lot more information under concepts than there is under the summary panel of things to which the player should be mindful So there's quite a bit of information. You do have to, as I mentioned, guard against information overload. And not be overwhelmed by it, but use the information that is usable to you. I would suggest that you go to the basic game decode and go move by move looking at the superficial decode through the entirety of the game and then after you've done that run your dig deeper decode on your critical positions that you might have had questions about or that were identified as mistakes after you've already gone through the superficial list because this will give you a very basic idea without overloading you with a ton of information 
and then the deep decode will give you more in-depth information that you can pick and choose the important parts and benefit from those. And you may want to do it in more than one session. You can see here we're, we're already over an hour looking at this. And, um, and we've only looked at a couple of deep decode positions. So you can really get into it. But some of the best features are, of course, the explanations, um, the suggested improvements, like here, where we're, where it's pointed out that bishop takes e6 would have been much better. Um, well, the main reason, and I don't know if, if Gideon, you and your developers can work on not just saying why bishop takes e6 is good, but also telling why this was such a bad move. Uh, for example, you could perhaps write in here, and, and this is where it would be handy for a coach to be able to make notes, that f takes e6 is bad because it traps the bishop. And so, um, in fact, I'll send an email on that as well. All right, well, Hopefully this will be helpful to you and you'll enjoy using it along with the other resources. Remember that you always want to go over the game on your own first and get as much out of it that you can get and then use the various tools at your disposal to, um, to get things that you may have overlooked. And uh, if you have any questions, email me, and uh, I'll do my best to answer them. All right, so until next time, for chess.com and for Decode Chess, I'm Coach Daniel, also known as King's Bishop here at chess.com. Have a great day, and play some great chess. Bye now.